ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning. Um, welcome to the Color of Beauty discussion panels. We are exploring how the style industry in the field of fashion, luxury, beauty, and entrepreneurship is speaking to a multicultural audience. Please welcome our moderator, Delana Dixon. Delana is a petite powerhouse editor, producer, and on-air on correspondent. Delana appears on the live celebrity entertainment show, The Gossip Table, for VH1. <coughs> She is a co-founder and editor-in-chief of DeepGalsDaily.com, a premier destination site for women of all colors, and writes a celebrity column for Jet, JetMag.com. Well, please well, help me welcome Delana Dixon. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Now, style is designed, uh, is described as a distinctive appearance typically determined by the principles according to which something is designed. Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans and other multicultural women already wield buying power in excess of $1 trillion, and the fashionery and luxury markets are finally taking notice. Today we plan to explore how this market is speaking to the multicultural woman, and we have a very esteemed panel with us this morning to lead us in the discussion, so let's meet our panel. First, we have Stacy Henderson. She is the Vice President of Marketing for Westfield World Trade Center, which will open in New York City in 2015. We have Carmen Cita Wonder, the CEO and founder of Of Wonder, a luxury fashion line for women sizes 12 to 24. We have Marielle Bobo, who is the Style Director of Ebony Magazine, and of course, George Brescia, a style expert and author of the upcoming book, Change Your Life, Change Your Clothes, Because You Can't Be Naked. <laughs> so welcome everyone this morning. So we're just gonna start right here with Stacy. I want you to just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the fashion field. Sure, um, hi everyone, I'm Stacy Henderson. I um, um, started fashion actually by um, going to graduate school in Milan, there was a program at Bocconi that um, all the luxury businesses in Italy, they basically got together because there was a need for business people in luxury fashion. And I did that some time ago, was quickly offered a position after graduating with Salvatore Ferragamo. And I worked in Florence for about four years um, with Ferragamo. And um, after that, I was at Versace, and I oversaw their marketing and communications for approximately eight years. And gosh, about seven months ago, I received um, a huge opportunity to be a part of the Westfield World, Shop, World, World Trade Center Retail District that they're opening in 2015. I'm Carmen Cita Wonder, uh, and I, I guess I could say I have a non-traditional uh, path. Um, I've had a non-traditional path to fashion. Um, I uh, previously worked in politics, finance, and international affairs, uh, I, where I was uh, worked for a U.S. ambassador and I was also um, a senior advisor to uh, Senator Chuck Schumer uh, in New York. Um, in that role, I was his liaison on Wall Street and I have always loved fashion and, uh, and thought of myself as someone very fashion conscious and fashion forward, but as a woman who wears um, clothing larger than a size 12, um, I really started to face some challenges to find beautiful you know, clothing made of premium fabrics and just elevated style. Uh, and so I, uh, you know, in my daily interactions, I would be with CEOs and uh, find myself with you know, cabinet members of the US government. And while I had very beautiful accessories, my apparel really didn't uh, look the part or not in the way that I wanted it to. And so um, after a very frustrating shopping experience a little over a year ago, I decided that I really needed to do something about it. And with over 62% of women in America today wearing an average size of 14 or larger, I realized that I wasn't alone in this, and so that um, I, you know, in my job, I have spent a lot of time, in my previous job, I spent a lot of time working uh, with the underserved in housing and in banking, and I realized that I needed to use those same skills to begin to 
work with this underserved market and fashion as well. So we launched a wonder uh, really to address this market need and uh, to bring elevated style and premium fabrication and just quality to this woman that has essentially been completely locked out of a luxury market. Thank you. I'm Mariel Bobo, and I'm the style director for Ebony Magazine. Uh, I started out in fashion about 14 years ago. I began as a model agent for Wilhelmina Models, but knew that I always wanted to kind of foray into publications. Uh, my first job in publishing uh, was at Allure Magazine, where I started kind of at the bottom as the fashion assistant and worked my way up. Uh, five years later, when I left the magazine, I was the market editor, um, handled the luxury fashion and accessories market and then went on to work for Cosmo Girl magazine, uh, later Women's Wear Daily, where I worked for about three years as an accessories editor, and uh, later on moved on to Essence, uh, and now Ebony. Uh, throughout my career, I have worked for a variety of other publications, such as Women's Wear, uh, in addition to Women's Wear Daily, I worked for uh, Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, Glamour, Self Magazine, and also served as the senior fashion editor for OK Magazine. Hello, I'm George Brescia, and I have to say I'm so excited to be sitting on such a panel of beautiful, gorgeous women. I feel privileged. Um, I uh, started in fashion with Ralph Lauren when I was younger, and I um, traveled the country doing all of the retail stores, teaching them about the line, and doing all the trunk shows and special events in the polo retail stores. And then I went to the other side of the business and worked with Tommy Hilfiger for a number of years as a vice president of creative services. And um, then I went on my own and I became a stylist and a style expert, uh, working with a lot of celebrities and a lot of different kinds of people, men and women, but just you know everything from soccer moms to celebrities to CEOs of companies. And I have to say that um, what I've really learned as I've been out there dressing people especially women, um, a lot, most of my clients are women, although I do have men as well. It's just really so fulfilling to me to get a woman to understand how, how beautiful she is and discover her beauty and to embrace it. And I find that so rewarding. Um, I've just finished my book called Change Your Clothes, Change Your Life Because You Can't Go Naked and this talks all about that. You know, I think it's such a responsibility for a woman to be beautiful and how does she deal with that? How does she deal with other women and how does she deal with men and how does she deal in the workforce and it's um, you know it, it's a complicated thing and it just gives me so much joy to watch a woman discover herself and you see it in the first five minutes when I'm working with someone you know they look in the mirror and they're oh yeah there she is there's that there's that beautiful girl that used to run around New York City or go around with her friends and you know because they become mothers and wives and business women and it's just um, I find it very interesting so I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Pamela. So the first thing we wanted to explore is just how has the community of color been ignored by the fashion and luxury industry? Has it been ignored? Um, and what is it doing to change that? So what, what are some of your feelings on that? I'll take the... <laughs> um, I do feel, you know, obviously, you know, African Americans are a huge part of the, of the retail market. And um, unfortunately, I do feel like uh, you don't see the images reflected in the same way in terms of seeing you know, women of color uh, in the pages of these publications and also in uh, you know, huge ad campaigns and things like that. Um, I will say, though, that with the dawning of social media, there has been a huge uh, opportunity now for bloggers of color and um, online publications where you're seeing a lot more uh, African Americans that are starting their own publications where they are starting to uh, highlight what they love in the luxury market and they're actually able to have more of a voice now as well. So I think that in that respect, uh, it really has kind of opened up in terms of giving, uh, uh, you know, writers of color um, a voice to really talk about luxury fashion and things like that that they're into that we're maybe not seeing in a lot of the high fashion magazines. Well, you know, Interesting question. I, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily ignored. Um, you know, coming from European luxury brands, you know, I think that personally when I think about marketing campaigns and communication and advertising, I think it takes many forms. So you first, of course the first things that we see, we see the runway 
and we also see, of course, the advertising campaigns. But I think we have to also think about the other things that especially luxury brands do um, to market and to work and collaborate with different ethnicities, be it red carpet dressing, which takes a lot of resources, a lot of time. You know, at, at, I won't say the brand, one of our brands, it, it almost took as much money and time as an ad campaign or as a runway show because it's so intense when you look at dressing someone for the Golden Globes or whatever award show. Um, the same thing when I think it comes to the various events, that's another thing, because I do, I do think that with events, a lot of times I know when we were seeking out talent for events, which again, is very expensive, you know, it, it's, it, it, it just depends on, I have to be honest, it depends on the brand, their identity. That being said, as of course a woman of color and as a person who's traveled the world and, and I feed off of diversity, um, I. I remember there was a void. So now, quite frankly, when I'm opening um, the publications, still there's much work to be done from the surface, meaning runway shows and publications. But of course, when you look through these things and you see that there, there's a bit more representation than there was maybe five years ago, it, it makes me smile when I look through. I just look through um, the Vogue. Um, a couple, I don't know if you guys saw the February issue, but you could see the difference if you look a couple years ago. And I was, and it was even before I was asked to be on this panel, I opened up February Vogue and I'm like, wow. And that's really thanks to, that's this warm and fuzzy feeling that we get. So, you know, I don't know if that's a proper answer to yeah. your question, but I, but I do want to say so there's two things for luxury brands. One is the identity of the brand and the, the, whoever their muse may be at the time or a lot of times relationships in the ad campaign could be someone that someone knew for like 20 or 30 years and was their muse. Um, another thing I do want to say though, that we have to also look, there's more to it than an ad campaign and a runaway show. These things are very important, but there are other ways that luxury brands communicate um, with their clients and consumers. Well, actually, you know, I wanted to um, reach out, and George, I think you can speak on this. Um, tell me a little bit about, we see like Lupita Nyong'o, who's become just a fashion icon. Do you think that luxury brands are finally saying, we can use celebrities of color to put out, to reach this audience? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, first of all, get out of my head, because that's exactly <laughs> what I was just thinking. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I think that you make a very good point. And I think that, you know, Hollywood um, and motion pictures and television has really helped us with this. And certainly, um, Lupita Nyong'o is an amazing example. I did a Golden Globe wrap up um, for Fox News, and you know, I was like, Lupita Nyong'o came on the red carpet and shut it down in that red Ralph Lauren dress. I mean, she was just exquisite, and that face is like, you know, it's rude. I mean, she's just beautiful. Um, but I do think that Hollywood is really helping to do that. I mean, Halle Berry, certainly, I, I, you know, I mean, Oprah Winfrey, my God, just looks amazing all the time, and certainly her magazine, and you know, I think that we're seeing it so much more, and I know even when I worked at Ralph Lauren, I mean, I remember Beverly Johnson, you know, in ad campaigns, and I certainly, Naomi Campbell and Tyra Banks, and even a Tommy Hilfiger, Tyra Banks was, did our national ad campaign, and you know, I just, I think that um, as a stylist and a style expert, beauty is beauty, you know, and, 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 I, and I find it inspiring. Um, and I also think that just for my own purposes, I mean, just being selfish, I love dressing women of color because you all look be so beautiful in so many different kinds of things. It's so fantastic because you can basically wear anything um, in terms of color and fabric and, and I'm all about that. So I just think it's really cool. And I do think that it is much more um, infiltrated. I think it has a long way to go, um, I, you know, and I, and I appreciate that and I think that I wanna see more African-American women on the cover of Vogue and on the cover of Glamour. Um, so, uh, you know, I just think it needs to keep being, but I do think Hollywood is a really good vehicle to do that. Wonderful. I, I wanted to um, just go off of that to Carmen Sita mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about um, when you think of African-American women, beautiful curves, um, full figure. So how do you think the fashion and luxury market is speaking to that, um, that market? You spoke a little bit about the complications of trying to find clothes for a full-figured woman. Um, well, first I wanted to quickly say that I, I agree with a lot of the comments that were made by George and Stacy, and I think um, even another example of a really great campaign that has gotten the, t the attention of a lot of people is Givenchy with Erica Badu. I mean, people are so excited that they 
really spoken up about this issue and that they put her, um, used her, they're using her as the face of those green collections. So I think they're really good examples. Um, where our market is concerned, um, I think that we've actually been completely shut out of the luxury market. Um, where apparel is concerned, um, obviously we all have tons of fabulous jewelry and bags and shoes, but um, but I mean we'd be very hard pressed to find a gorgeous dress, uh, you know, career separates or even uh, a, a gown for that matter. And I think. Um, so I think as much as there are obviously issues with colorism, I think that there is a big size, there's, there's a size uh, bias that I think does exist um, that because, and I always joke and say that, you know, if I could, if I could have worn, you know, Donna Karen collection helmet laying in Rick Owens, I would have never started this brand. And I think for a number of women of color, um, in many instances, uh, we do have curves, we have, you know, large bust lines, many of us, we do have hips and, uh, you know, and, a bo and bodies that don't fit into a number of the cuts that exist in a number of these brands uh, in their, you know, their, their uh, aesthetics, and there just aren't any options for us. And so I think that we actually have been completely ignored and there may be, uh, there are a handful of designers that uh, that do produce that do produce clothing for our our size category, but um, our size range, but it's not. But there are so many other beautiful collections out there that I wish that I had had access to. That I just, I mean, it just wasn't even possible. Well, I totally can understand that as a, as a person under five feet. It can be challenging as well, but for full figured. Um, and it kind of takes me to my next question. I'm going to go to Marielle. Um, how do you think it's important for uh, companies and in, when it deals with advertising to have images of women of color and multicultural um, to speak their brand to the audience they're trying to reach? Oh, definitely. Um, I think, especially for me, I mean, I think back to when I first started out in publishing and, you know, the magazines that spoke to me. You know, I was a girl who grew up loving fashion and wanted to, you know, have access to certain high end brands but for a long time didn't see myself reflected in the pages of a lot of the ads. And going back to Lupita, who we were talking about earlier, she, you know, she actually has been tagged as a new face for Miu Miu. And um, you know, there are other brands that are having you know, more African-American models, so that definitely does make a, di a big difference. Uh, but I do feel it is you know, very, very important. Image is everything. And it's hard a lot of times for us as African-Americans to feel like the brand speaks to us when we're not seeing ourselves. Uh, in their ads, and also on the publishing side when we're not seeing ourselves in the pages. Um, I know for myself, even in my own experience in publishing, you know, working for a lot of uh, the high fashion books, I always found myself kind of being the only, you know, African American face at the magazines. And when you look around and you see the other editors, you're not seeing yourself reflected in the staff. So that also kind of affects what's reflected in the pages. Um, and so I think, you know, really having more of us behind the scenes and being involved in a lot of the decision making will also help with that. But, you know, all that to say that I do think that, you know, there has been a lot, there have been some strides made in terms of seeing more African Americans in the luxury ads, but I still feel like there is a long way to go. And sometimes when it happens, it's kind of like a novelty thing. And I feel like it should be more of a regular thing that's integrated versus it being, you know, a rarity that just kind of is happening, but you know, it's, you know, Erica Badu in the as the face of Givenchy is great, but you know, it, it's, it's kind of become a, a novelty versus it being, you know, why can't we always have that kind of thing happen regularly? So I think that having it be more of a regular integration would be uh, something that would serve us a little bit better. That's a perfect uh, point that you make, and it kind of takes me into my next question, and this is for the whole panel. What, what should luxury companies uh, be focusing on in their marketing to, pe to appeal to the ethnic consumer? Um, and it's open for anyone who wants to take that. Well, I think you have an amazing point. And I think there's a couple of things, and I know this is a little off topic of marketing, and I think it's the reflection of the people that are working there, to be honest. Because I do think, so at my old job, and I don't want to speak really on behalf of them because I don't work there anymore, but at my old company, there's two types of budgets that I'm, I'm speaking from a European brand perspective. 
you have your global budget, right? And that global budget, the ad campaigns, the fashion shows they do in Milan. And then we have our local budget, and that's what I was really responsible for. How do we take this brand and make it applicable to the United States? So, honestly, I know there are a couple of times that if me as a woman of color, if I were not there, I couldn't speak to certain sensitivity. I couldn't look at it, understanding the value of recruiting other people of other ethnic backgrounds. And I think so. That there's two things. One, I think, is actually having um, a more visible presence of diversity on your staff. That's key. And I think once you have that, you can start looking at, OK, we're planning events at all of our, let's say, retail boutiques across the world. Where, what, what, what should we do? Because we know the US is different than Italy. And quite frankly, I do have to admit, Italians is not on their top of mind, not all the time, but for Italians, their society is a lot different than the US when it comes to diversity. We are just a lot more diverse here. Our reality is a lot different growing up. Our background is a lot different than it is in lots of, lots of European countries. So if you take that and couple it with a person that, you know, with a diverse like, staff to sort of help you um, market properly to those in the United States, I think that's helpful. And I, and I know there have been times, let's say we were going to Atlanta to do an event, and I had to tell my mom, you know, they were like, well, all the girls on our runway look like this. This is how it should look. I'm like, no, 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 that can't happen. It just can't happen. So I, I really do agree with you in terms of it more than like what people see on the outside, you have to also look at the inside and look who you're staffing and make sure you have a diverse group of people to be able to talk to the makeup of especially the United States. George, uh, I would love for you to comment on this as well, being a stylist and working with these luxury brands. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I think that you make a good point. I mean, it really does have to be on the inside so that you can sit at a table and you can brainstorm with a group of people and have different kinds of people sitting at that table that can add to that discussion and, and make it so that you can reach all the different groups out there. I mean, again, I think that, you know, I, you know, beauty is beauty. And, 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 you know, each magazine, you know, has a point of view, obviously, and has a different demographic no matter what the situation is. But I think within that demographic, it's important to be diverse because we are not a world of any one thing. We're a world of many different kinds of things. And I think that, you know, um, I happen to be, you know, a, a very spiritual person as well. And I think that that sort of is incorporated in that. It's to embrace everything and to love everything and to show the world what is out there and to appeal to everyone, to inspire everyone within the demographic of whatever your publication is or whatever your brand is or whatever luxury brand it is. Because again, there, there certainly is a point of view for each brand. Um, but I do think it's so important. And like I said, you know, it's, it's always to inspire, you know, and it's, there should be an aspiration always to, to get people excited and, and have diversity within that. So. Carly Seeker, L'Oreal, do you have a comment? Um, I was, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, Stacy's the marketing expert up here, so I would leave her uh, to talk about what, uh, what type of specific marketing strategies should be put in place, but I do think that um, there does need to be recognition of, like, in the African American community, what our buying power is, and the fact that we do tend to outspend our white counterparts by $1,900, even though many people in our community live on much smaller budgets. And I think there does need to be, you know, an understanding that we, as a community, do consume a great deal of luxury items, whether it's cars, clothing, jewelry. And so, um, so I think there does need to be a little more done to, to, to be inclusive of us in some of these uh, images and campaigns. I agree 100% with Stacy and, uh, and George and Mariel that that you, and I think it's in any industry, fashion, politics, business, that you will reach those communities more if you have more of those people represented on your teams, period. Yeah, you, you have to change the decision makers. And I think you see with other communities of colors like the Asian, uh, community, you know, Asian American community or Asian in general, when you have designers like Philip Lim and Derek Lamb 
and all of those folks existing, they have a say in the fact that they want to see Asian women represented in their campaigns, and they have been quite successful at that. Um, and I think, so I think you have to have more of us at the table in order for this to happen. Absolutely. Uh, one, one more thing I wanted to add. Um, I think again, you know, with a lot of these luxury brands, obviously there is the, they, you know, they're aware that obviously they need to be able to target African American women and that they need to be diverse. But I think again, going back to the fact that a lot of these brands don't have us reflected on their staffs, they're kind of not really aware of how to target to us. Um, I can't tell you how many times, um, I cover both fashion and beauty at Ebony. I've met with different luxury brands who are maybe looking to diversify, that are maybe coming out with a foundation or a makeup product that is you know, more diverse colors and things like that, wanting to um, target African American women. But then when you have the meeting, you know, either the, formula the formulations aren't correct, the tones aren't correct, um, it's, you're getting the high-end product and maybe a Burberry foundation or an Armani foundation, but the, you know, the tones and the richness of it isn't there. So they're attempting to reach the, you know, the African-American woman, 